like I said, 300 postcards a week, you would probably get about 15 calls. And then out of those 15, probably send offers on eight and probably three or four would be back and forth, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. You know, they would still answer your phone call and it was still good. They didn't just like blow you off because it was too low. And probably out of 1,500 postcards, probably one deal, 2,000 postcards, one deal. But I mean, $100,000 deal, right? So it's definitely worth it. This is episode number 26 of the Multifamily Success Stories podcast. Would you like to turn vacant units into cash and earn up to three times more per door without having to do any extra work yourself? We offer fully managed short-term rental solutions for multifamily investors. Go to managedbylux.com for more information. Hey, this is John Bell and Julian Sage. And welcome to the Multifamily Success Stories podcast. This is a show where we talk to multifamily investors about their journeys and starting and growing their real estate empires. Our goal is that you'll be able to walk away not only inspired, but with practical information to help you in your real estate journey. Since we are a new show, please go over to iTunes and leave us a review and let us know what you enjoy. And if you haven't done so already, go on over to our Facebook group, the Multifamily Success Network to connect with the community. Hey, what is going on, Dean Lakers? Julian here. And in this episode, I had the special honor of speaking with Mauricio Ramos, the uh, managing member of the De Medici Group, a real estate investment firm with 135 doors and $9 million of assets under management, with the majority of properties being in the San Antonio and McAllen, Texas area. In this episode, Mauricio shares his experience of starting in real estate through mobile home investing to wholesaling single family, then eventually finding success through multifamily wholesaling. So something that uh, I'd never heard before, but uh, it makes a lot of sense during this conversation. Uh, Mauricio also shares uh, how he was able to actually uh, scale and grow a wholesaling multifamily business uh, that's been able to generate over six figures just on a single deal. And he's been able to do multiple of these deals. Uh, we talk about the numbers, we talk about the breakdown, uh, go into all of that. And also what has allowed him to scale his investment portfolio by finding these great off market deals. So not working directly with brokers, uh, being able to find these really sweet deals. If you like my show notes for this episode, go to multifsuccess.com backslash EP26. Or if you like my show notes sent directly to your inbox every week, then go to multifsuccess.com backslash show notes. With all that being said, on to this week's conversation. Hey, welcome back, Dealmakers, to another episode of Multifamily Success Stories. In this episode, I have the special honor of speaking with Mauricio Ramos. Uh, Mauricio, would you please introduce yourself to the Dealmaker community, let them know who you are and what inspired you to get into multifamily investing? Absolutely. Thanks, Julian. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Uh, So my name is Mauricio Ramos. Uh, I'm originally from Mexico. I um, came to Texas for college, uh, graduated as a civil engineer in um, worked in the construction industry for 10 years and then throughout that i came up to the conclusion that uh, i didn't want to be an employee for the rest of my life so along the way i found real estate was introduced to real estate by my now business partner and uh definitely uh, fell in love with the idea of passive passive income and then later on found multifamily and just kind of found a saw it as a way of basically like 10 xing what I was doing and where I wanted to go. And I was able to quit my job, like I said, 10 years later and, and after working in the construction industry in 2018, and I've been doing real estate full time ever since. So when you started off and you were in uh, construction and you were doing, uh, was that like still related to real estate though? Yeah, so I was I was doing construction. I was working for a GC um, as a project manager, and I we did commercial, large commercial projects, such as a high school, like an entire high school, from you know ninety acres of cane field, turning it into a full blown high school, uh, hospitals, um, build, um, headquarters for the Texas Department of Public Safety, um, hotels. Uh, public um, construction for the city of San Antonio, things things like that, projects like that, multi-million dollar projects. 
so what i mean you're you're in the real estate space and you're you're uh kind of involved in that but why uh what what kind of led to wanting to do more or to go out and do it on yourself the construction or going from from construction to real estate from construction to your own your own real estate yeah yeah so i didn't want to be an employee the rest of my life uh, i met um met a few people along the way you know when i was working i met some of my coworkers were probably in their 50s or 60s and i saw that they they had been doing what they were doing for you know 30 40 years and they were about to retire but they didn't really haven't seen much or didn't really have a like a retirement plan put together other than than just whatever social security they were going to get. I was like, God, that's not what I want. Also, I met some people um, that traveled and I was like, "There's, I wanted to travel and there, there has to be a way that you can travel and then still make money, right? It, it sh there shouldn't be just like go to work and save like for an entire year, save so you can get two weeks of vacation and then you can go travel uh, and then come back to work another year. Like that's that's not the way it is. It should be another way. So I dabbled with that idea for about a year until I finally found real estate. And I, you know, re learned about the buy and hold and a little bit of cash flow in each house. And I was like, okay, this is it. This 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 is very doable to like where I want to go and be able to retire early and not be working for the rest of my life. And and then as I started educating myself, learning, reading books, listening to podcasts, that's when I heard on a podcast, somebody talk about multifamily. And I'm an engineer. I'm still an engineer. So, so multifamily is very numbers oriented versus single family, which is very comps oriented, right? Because of the location and how many, how much did the house next door sold for, things like that. So when I saw multifamily and understood the way it worked, it just clicked in my head, you know, my, my engineering mind and just fell in love with it. And it started, you know, started educating myself about multifamily, um, tried a few things and started working and started just finding properties and started making good money, good income. And the rest is the story. So I mean, you you were I mean, your primary job uh, as a civil engineer was was in real estate. So what? Why aren't the people, or why didn't you feel that um, like were people that were in that industry that you were doing they they just weren't interested in like investing you know their income into real estate? Like, was there some type of separation? Yeah. So so I was an employee for a general contractor, right? Uh, is it this larger company? Uh, I worked for a, a few general contractors. Uh, and I was just an employee, you know, my job was to manage the, all the subcontractors and the timeline of the project, make sure it was done within budget and within, within the time frame that we're allotted to do it. So that was my job. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I had no exposure really to, I mean, now that I do what I do, uh, and reposition multifamily properties, my, my knowledge in construction is very, very useful. But I had no exposure to like the return side, the investor side, the the how it looked on the ownership side. I my my, my view was really from the GC perspective, from the builder perspective, taking a fee. We were we as a GC were just taking a fee of the entire cost of the project, and you know I was getting a salary out of that. But I had no exposure. Now I can see it from the other side, right? Now we hire GCs to do that. Now we hire subcontractors as the owners. Uh, sometimes we we are also the GC, right? So now it's a, it's the other side of the coin. Uh, but it was it, it wasn't until I learned about how it worked in real estate and you know reached that poor dad and cash flow quadrant kind of thing. When, when I, that opened my eyes and I was able to, to, to work my way to the other side of the coin. And now I'm, um, I see it from the other perspective. So what, what was your, I mean, what was your current or your situation back then prior to getting into real estate? Like, uh, did you have like a lot of money to be able to invest into property or did you have, um, you know, obviously you had that GC experience, but um, where were you right before you actually took the dive in, into getting your first property? 
Great, great question. No, I, I mean, I wasn't born with a silver spoon. Uh, no, didn't get any money from my family other than education. Um, and I was making good money as an engineer, but I was you know, typical American, right? You know, you make money, you spend money, right? Uh, I had a, an okay car and I was living in an apartment in a nicer area of San Antonio. And, uh, and this is when I found finally real estate. And so I read The Richest Man in Babylon, which is, is a great book, highly recommend it. And that's when I started really saving up 10%. And then I tightened it up a little bit and went to 15%. And in no time, I had like seven or 8,000 in uh, the first deal, my very first deal was a mobile home. Uh, I just wanted to get started in, in somehow I found, you know, mobile home could be a good, a good way to start. So I bought a mobile home, which was at a mobile home park. So I just bought a, an old decent condition mobile home, uh, remodeled it with my construction knowledge, right. And, um, paid cash for it and then paid cash for all the, all the rehab and then seller financed it out, got a down payment and then charged interest and they took like 36 months to pay it off. Um, and law of the first deal, I was able to do it right after, like within a month of selling that first one, same park, I found another one. So same thing, bought it, fixed it, seller financed it out. And, and this guy gave me like a $10,000 down payment. So, so there I was, two deals under my belt, getting receiving cash flow every month from those two deals and ten thousand dollars right so i was able to go into like another deal and it's just a little snowball right but that's and that's how kind of it all started that's, that's really uh that's really funny because when i when i first got started into real estate it was with mobile home mobile, mobile home investing, investing. It was this guy. guy uh john john fadro uh from vigor yeah i've heard of him too. yeah i've heard of him yeah. and he uh so I, I took his his program and learned how to do it. Uh, then I realized, oh, I I don't like mobile homes. <laughs> like I don't I don't want to be uh, flipping mobile homes. But uh, you, you, it sounds like you were doing pretty successful with that, and you, you're probably making a probably a few hundred dollars per and able to get that you know that deposit. So you know what? Why not just keep keep on doing that and scale that up? Yeah, yeah. So so and and real uh, quick parentheses or funny story within that. Uh, so one of the, one of the, my first, my very first mobile home that I was telling you about, um, that was lot 24. And when I was fixing that and selling that, I remember talking to, to lot 25, the owner of the home of lot 25. And then I just gave him my card and say, Hey, you know, if you, if you're ever ready to sell, I introduced myself to say, Hey, I'm the new owner of this place. If there's like a fire or something, just call me, right? This is my number. And, and I, and he's like, what do you do? And said, this is what I do. I invest in this. So if you're ever interested, let me know. So fast forward, this is 2000, this is May, 2017. Fast forward to now, I just bought his house, his, mo his mobile home, lot 25, three, four years later. So it's, that's just like, he kept my card and he called me whenever he was ready. So that was, that's just, uh, amazing but so to answer your question i um my business partner was doing my now business partner i mean at the time I, he was my intern at the construction company so he was doing wholesaling uh single family wholesaling and i kind of like that idea and my goal was to have uh at that time uh, buy and hold houses right i want the houses so I started looking for houses. We were doing door knocking um, for foreclosures and a few things, marketing, sending postcards. And we were able to wholesale a couple of houses like that. And around this time was when I started marketing to multifamily properties, small multis, five to 30 units. So we wholesale a house, made $30,000 fee. So we split it 15 and 15. It is right around when I got under contract my first deal, which was a 10 unit apartment complex in Pleasanton, Texas. And the, the, I negotiated, those were crazy terms. It was like seven and a half down. It was $12,000 down plus closing cost, 0% interest for 20 years. So my fee 
my $15,000 fee went towards uh, the down payment of my first multifamily property. I mean, it sounds sounds like you've kind of had the the real estate entrepreneur life cycle, you know, starting off, you know, doing something smaller and then scaling up, then trying wholesaling. And so it sounds like you've tried a bunch of different things, but you were also kind of successful around those things. A lot of people, they'll start something, especially wholesaling. A lot of people get into wholesaling and it's just never find a deal. And, you know, it's, uh, it can be very challenging for people, but you guys, you know, it sounds like you actually had some success. So why not? you know, just continue on with that and build the business that, you know, other people say like you know, around wholesaling or mobile home investing, single family flips, whatever it is. For sure. So what I, from the beginning, my, my, like I mentioned, the, the, I wanted buy and hold, right? I wanted the cash flow. I wanted to be in the I quadrant, you know, part of that education, right? I wanted to build and I want to build wealth, like long lasting wealth, not just like the, the quick $5,000. Uh, we've done very good fees, six-figure fees on, on wholesaling. Uh, but so we quickly realized that uh, single family is going to take forever to, to get, you know, 20 houses, right? It was going to take forever. Um, and multifamily was going to be a lot faster. And also came to, found, to find out that uh, wholesaling multifamily it's a lot more profitable than wholesaling single family. So, so that's, that's, that's that time, which was the end of 2017 in December. That's when I closed in that, that 10 unit. That's when I pretty much kind of said goodbye to single family and just, just focused on multi. Uh, and it's, it's just been multi ever since I, in, in the whole, in the whole, in that time I bought one single family that, fell into my lap and just like it's just too good to let it go and I and I bought it it's a rental but but all my portfolio is multifamily and you you actually said that you you were wholesaling multifamily properties we yeah we've wholesaled multifamily properties uh a, a good number of them and we we still we still do so i mean you know with wholesaling that's where you're finding a deal off market typically, and then you're giving it to an investor that's going to be putting, you know, money into rehabbing it. So why why would you go through all of the effort that somebody else doesn't want to do, find these, you know, really sweet deals, and then you know pass it off to somebody else when you already had that experience with like flipping it and and doing all that? So it's been it's been like, I think it's been partially not being ready to to buy that deal at that point. Um, there was a eight unit apartment complex in Kingsville, Texas that I wholesaled and I just wasn't ready or didn't have the, it was really didn't have the knowledge to buy it myself at the time and kind of know how to run it. So I made like 25,000 uh, fee on it, which I put that money into my 10 unit, right? And, and to, to fix it up. And then I found a 24 unit here in San Antonio that was a historical building uh, in a great location, like gentrifying location in San Antonio, uh, which needed a lot of work, a lot. I mean, I think the guy that bought it still been working on it for the last two years. Uh, so needed a lot of work. So I didn't have the structure at the time to take on that type of project. Plus he said, I mean, these buildings, there's two buildings. One of them was built in 1896 and the other one was built in 1924. So you can imagine what you're going to find out when you open a wall there, right? And those, those kind of things. So I was not geared at this point. I would, I would love to take on a project like that, but I, two years ago, I wasn't geared to a project like that. So I figured like I kind of run my numbers on when I got it under where I got under contract and what I could sell it for is like, I mean, why not six figure fee? Why not? Right. Let's do it. I mean, it's more than what I was making in an entire year uh, working as an engineer. Uh, so sure enough, I did sold it, closed on it. And that's when I pretty much said, all right, that's it. I'm a, I put like a three month notice at my, at my job and that was it. So, so that, that deal that really kind of allowed you the the freedom to be able to pursue real estate full time was was a wholesale multi multifamily deal for and you were able to get around a six 
six figure uh, commission off of that? Six figure fee. It was w- well over twice my yearly income. Wow. Now, what, what, I mean, what were some of the, did you like analyze the numbers? I mean, I mean that, that's a pretty, pretty hefty fee. I, I imagine that there's got to be some, some good profit on the back end. Um, did, did you ever like go back and like look at the numbers or did you even analyze that as a potential long term hold for yourself? Like if you did raise capital or. Yeah. It, so it wasn't like the typical, the typical cash flowing multifamily, you know, 80, 90 percent occupied. It, it, it was it was it wasn't stable. Rents were super low. It, it was it was a the type of project was uh, or the best use of the property was just. Get rid of everything that's in there. I mean, you cannot demo it because it's historical. It's great location, but get rid of, get rid of everything. Like all new plumbing, all new electricity, all new walls. I mean, pretty much every, everything inside is going to be new. So I wasn't geared for that. You know, I, I was, uh, I would, I was okay, and I, that's kind of what we do for the most part now with the typical. You know, just light remodel or remodel and light fixtures and that kind of thing. So it was more of a, at, at least the way I saw it, it was more of a deep pockets project, just uh, a lot of old oh shit money, uh, that, that kind of, that kind of project. So I wasn't, I didn't feel that I was geared for that. So I, I analyzed the number, like you're saying, I analyzed the numbers for, all right, this is how much I'm getting it for. And this is how much it can make, right? So I created a little marketing package, put it out there. Within 24 hours, I had it under contract for actually 50000 over asking because the buyer was like, I want it. What do you need? Like, I'm going to throw in another 50 and it's yours. Sure, sure enough. <laughs> Wow, that 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 is wild. This is the fir- first time that I've heard someone. You know, uh, usually when you think of wholesaling, you th- you're thinking of you know single families, but multi multifamily. That's that's pretty interesting. There's a lot of people, you know, that are probably listening that uh, they're trying to find that sweet deal. You know, they're talking to talking to the brokers. They're going out there. They're you know cold calling. They're trying to do flyers. Like, what what are you doing specifically that's allowed you to be able to keep on finding these these deals? Talking directly to owners, talking directly to owners, postcards, calls, go visit. Uh, I mean, if you see a small apartment, it has a per rent sign uh, that it's one of those like um, it's not the like San Antonio management sign. Right. It's a Home Depot for rent sign with a handwritten phone number. Very likely that is a phone number. That is the cell phone of the owner. So just call and say, hey. Multifamily buyer here in in town saw your property. You're interested in selling. Can I, can we give you an offer? It's free. I mean, uh, a lot of people would say, okay, yeah. What do you need to know? Ask a few questions. Send him an offer, and you never know. You make you make it sound so easy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, but uh, is this, not is this something? Politics time, yeah. Is it is it something that that you could really do at scale? Like, I mean, like, how much effort did it take to find like that one? I'm I'm sure that you know someone's wishing that they could find just you know some multifamily deal out there. You know, uh, just call a number and then it's like, hey, can I get this from you? And then go around, go ahead and you know sell it to another uh, you know uh, Mauricio like that. You know, I'm gonna sell this property for a hundred thousand and now I can start my real estate career. Like, is it that easy or? I mean, it's it, it is not that easy. Um... At this point, I was sending about 300 postcards a, a week. A week while I had my, this is all while I, while I still had my my job, right? So I was sending 300 postcards a week, getting phone calls, analyzing numbers. And at this point, it was like one month show, right? It was just me. Um, I had I had a few, a few people that I knew that I could ask questions, but in my business partner, my now business partner, we weren't really business partners. We were just kind of like uh, accountability partners uh so i mean it does take time like i said 300 postcards a week uh consistently and and i mean it it does take some time takes a little bit of money too you know you have to buy stamps you have to buy postcards you have to print them out etc etc did you did you have like any formal training before that or did you know like what type of like kpi you're supposed to be hitting or like how many calls you should have been getting or was you would you were just all just winging this? Yeah. So listening to podcast and you know what what other wholesalers would 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 say 
also that 300 number at that um, at that point was my sweet spot for being able to attend my job and not be on my phone all the time answering phone calls right if i was to send more it was too many and i couldn't i couldn't keep up with that if it was less than that then it was too little right uh and i mean of course there's there were you know dozens and dozens of leads uh that you know had to analyze and offers follow up on the offers etc cetera, etc cetera, to be able to find these these few uh sweet deals uh, but you have to kiss a lot of frogs i guess can you can you kind of walk through like uh, realistically like so someone that's listening to this and they say man like i would i would love to be able to just find that $100,000 deal and you know get you know maybe i can partner on that or maybe i can wholesale it uh you know bird dog whatever whatever it is uh, can, can can you walk walk through the numbers of what it's like wholesaling multifamily to find like like uh, that that sweet deal from from the postcard to finding the deal to selling the deal yeah, yeah. Like, how many how many postcards did you have to send in order to get so many phone calls to get you know so many analyzed deals that you had to do so many offers to like that one deal that ended up working? I see. Yeah. So for for you would probably send like I said three hundred postcards a week. You would probably get about fifteen calls, uh, and then out of those fifteen, probably send offers on eight. And probably three or four would be back and forth, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. You know, they would still answer your phone call and it was still good. They didn't just like blow you off because it was too low. And I mean, not even one because it wasn't like I was getting one deal out of every 300 postcards, right? But uh, probably out of 1,500 postcards, probably one deal, 2,000 postcards, one deal. But I mean, hundred thousand dollar deal right so it's definitely worth it are, are just not a whole lot of people um you know trying to send postcards to multifamily owners or, or is it uh so i was sending it to small multi right so five to 30 which now i would definitely recommend go from like eight if not 12 to like 36 or 40 that's a good sweet spot uh You'll find, I was talking about this earlier uh, with somebody else. So you'll find that there's a lot of people in multi, in single family, right? One through four. Like a lot of people wanting to buy these duplexes and fourplexes. And so there's so much competition that, you know, there's a, depending on where you are in the U.S., a fourplex could be all the way from 300000 to 600000 or more, right? So, and the rents, they're, like the numbers don't really work in the multifamily model versus a well sorry so so you have all these people fighting for this small property like one through four right and then you have this big sharks uh in new york austin dallas florida california that are buying 100 plus unit properties right hard it's hard to compete with those guys because they can drop two hundred thousand dollar earnest money hard day one they want and they don't care right it's hard it's fine it's a cost of business right well if you're starting you, I mean, you don't have two hundred thousand uh, dollars to put hard right so then there's the sweet spot of 12 to 30 40 units where there's not a lot of competition there's not a lot of people looking at it very likely the owner is mom and pop they've owned it for 10, 12, 15 years, they're tired, older couple, or maybe he's just a lady, or maybe he's just a guy, it's just an older, elderly person that is just tired, they just want to do something else, they take care of the property, manage themselves, that is the type of owner that you'll find and, and you'll buy from at a discount and because the property will need love, you know, likely they'll tell you, uh, yo, well, I haven't raised the rent in like three years. Well, okay. I mean, it, and it's probably half what's on the market right now. Uh, so, so if you kind of like leave those two sides of the spectrum aside and focus on the less competitive spot, small multi, 
uh, you have a better chance in in my opinion or right? in my experience right i'm 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 living example of that uh one book that really explains somebody that wants to dive into this a lot more uh it's called big profits with small apartments or big money with small apartments by lance edwards uh highly recommended it explains like 101 kind of like how to get into multi how to wholesale multi as well um did i answer your question yeah no that, that's that's just really interesting because whenever i hear wholesaling you know i just think single family i've never heard of of multifamily but then it's also interesting that you're you're also you know uh your your play is to also long-term rent the multifamily but you're are you still actively like wholesaling these multifamily deals yeah. So great question. So our approach when we find a property, whether it's 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 broker or whatever it is, right? If it's a broker, if it's through a broker, it's going to be the price is going to be through the roof. So it doesn't going to it's not going to work for wholesale. But if it's an off market deal, right, it, our first approach is to syndicate it. Right. Can we own it? Can we buy it with our investors? And or even ourselves at this point, which now we have a little cushion, my business partner and I, where we can buy it on our own. Right. But can we buy it? Does it make sense for us? Is it in a good location where we have some presence? Is it cash flow right? Yes or no, right? If, if we can, then we'll we'll just buy it for ourselves. If we cannot buy it for, us, for ourselves for, for whatever reason, doesn't pencil, but we know it's a good property and it's we can get it at a good price enough where we can get, we can make good a good fee selling it then we'll get it under contract and wholesale it and make a fee. And so what what are you typically what are you typically looking for um uh for these these deals uh for like a commission versus uh versus what you would uh get long term renting it like if you invested and syndicated it. For sure. So our parameters are for for syndication we typically go with like a 70 30 split general partner limited partner. Um and with the value add, it's typically a three to five um, year hold. And we want to, to have at least like a nine cash on cash return average throughout the life of the project and 15% IRR and double the investor's money. So somebody that puts in 50,000, we want to be able to, to give them back at the end of the project another 50, right? Combine the proceeds of the sale plus the cash flow. If we cannot make that work, right? If if we pencil, I mean, we work on it, analyze the numbers, and all we can do is like sixty percent and like six percent cash flow or four percent cash flow. It's just not something that we're gonna sell to our investors. But there's no split, right? So it's a hundred percent to the new to the new buyer. So that allows us to to pay a little bit more, but we're not gonna keep it. So if we can make a good five figure fee, you know, depending on depending on the price, but say a good twenty percent fee, then just we'll we'll wholesale it. We'll get under contract and and then sell it. At this point, we have good buyers in different locations where it doesn't. It's not going to take us that long to sell it because we have strong buyers that are looking to buy this small multis. So it won't take that long to to sell. And what's your what's your typical commission on on these like versus what you would expect from doing like a single family uh, wholesale? Uh, I mean, I don't remember the last time I did a f uh, four figure wholesale fee. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, it's it's in two thousand seventeen when I was doing single family, but ever since all my all my fees have been five and six figures. Wow. So you you're able to get multiple six figure wholesale multifamily deals. Yeah, one, two, three, three six figures, and another three or four five figures. Wow, is it is it just not like a competitive market in the multifamily wholesaling space, or, or is, uh, is it that, just you? is that is that small area that I'm that I'm t I was explaining earlier? Is that small, like all those sharks? They won't look at a twenty-four unit, and the and the and most of the people buying singles and fourplexes, and they can stay there. Uh, they will they see 
this 32 unit, like, oh, one day I will graduate and buy a 32 unit. But for now, I'm okay with my homes. All right, stick to your to your homes, right? And the other guys can stay over there with the 200 units while I play with this 32 unit, right? I mean, it, it, it has its challenges if you want to own it, right? Because you cannot have an office. I, I get all that stuff, right? But, but um, it also propel you to get started, right? If you want to get started, that's that's kind of the other side, right? If you want to buy a hundred unit property, um, the broker that you're going to talk to, or the seller, or or the lender will say, "Well, what what do you own, right? Have you owned anything?" Well, no, I don't know anything. All I know, all I own is a fourplex, right, or nothing. Well, you, you it's going to be hard to have a conversation with them, right? But if you say, "Well, I own a sixteen unit, and a thirty two unit, and an eighty eight unit." And I sold a 10 unit in a, in a in a 16 unit. Well, I mean, all those are small, but yeah, you have the experience to run a 100 unit, right? So it, it's it's part of a career to get there, unless unless you want to drop forty thousand dollars and pay a guru somewhere to, you know, take a shortcut. Sure enough, you can do it. But if you have forty thousand dollars to drop it, go for it. What, what's your what's your ROI look like on on these multifamily wholesale deals? Like, how much do you have to put in in order to get X amount back? So, and another thing that we've been we've done good at is is creating that relationship and that that report with the sellers, where we don't have to drop like a big amount for a earnest money, right? It's really the earnest, which I mean, we did we did a. That first one that I was telling you about, I think I put three thousand dollars down, uh, earnest. Uh, I mean, we've done we've done sixteen unit and thirty two unit with like five hundred dollar earnest. Uh, so it's just creating that relationship with a seller and saying, hey, wh- why am I going to put that money there for ninety days uh, if if it's not gonna if it's not gonna give me anything? I can I have another property where I can drop. Five thousand dollars, and it's gonna give me some money. And the typical seller will see, will understand that, right? Like, okay, yeah, I get it, right? So, um, I mean, well, the I'm, ROI is really through the roof. To answer your question, because yeah, it, well, I'm, very little I'm saying, I'm saying, like from the time you start like sending those letters, like how many, le- like how much are you spending in ads or ad spend and, and marketing in order to get that return on the back end? Great, great question. So it really adds up to, I'd say a good budget would be like $1,000 a month for marketing, for for everything. And it's just for everything, about $1,000 a month. That's a good market, a good marketing budget. So, you know, if you do, even if you do say conservatively, four wholesales a year of $20,000 each, I mean, that's, Twelve thousand dollars in in eighty thousand uh, dollars ROI. I mean, it's pretty good. So, so one one thousand dollars a one thousand dollars a week a month a, a month one thousand dollars a month. Wow. So twelve twelve thousand dollars, and then you're you're typically able to see around a hundred thousand dollar deal out of that twelve thousand. I mean, if, if yeah, you should you should be able to yeah. If you're marketing to the right list and in the right location, and you can have a good conversation with uh, the sellers, yeah, you should. I don't see why you 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 wouldn't you wouldn't do it. So why not why not just keep on doing that? Like why not just blow that thing up and yeah, cash flow quadrant, right? I mean, it it's well, you have to pay high taxes on that. You would be going for the quick nickel instead of the slow dime, right? So, like I said earlier. What I had in mind, and I still have in mind, is long-term wealth, right? So the minute I, I just spent three weeks in Brazil, right, and this like my entire show was still running. Why? Because I, you create a team, a team in this the properties that we own. I mean, people keep paying rent, right? It doesn't matter if I'm in Brazil or not. Versus if you have a wholesaling business, right? If you create a whole system where you have people calling and everything, yes, that can be do, that can be done too. But if you if you have that type of business or like a flipping business and you leave to Brazil for, for three weeks, your business is going to hurt, right? It's going to slow down for three weeks. You're not going to get phone calls. You're not going to send offers. 
Uh, so that's why I do it. I want that long-term wealth uh, where I don't have to be part of it. And it's just owning real estate, you know, all the tax benefits of owning multifamily properties, that, that, that's what I envision for the long term. However, it's a great combination to have that plus wholesale properties. You know, if, if you sell a couple of properties like that, six figure fees every year, I mean, you're set, right? You're good. And that, that will allow you to invest in other properties. I was, I was going to say, you know, you, you, you've probably seen a lot of people in the space that, you know, they're, they're hungry for deals. They're calling a bunch of brokers. They're out there pounding the pavement. Um, but they're maybe not able to find those good, those good deals. Cause everybody's in the same, you know, pulling from the same pool. Are you not like fishing in the same pool as everybody else because of your experience with, with wholesaling? I do have relationships with brokers. We just find it that it's very difficult to, just engage with brokers in general. I, I, I need to be careful how to say it and not offend at the brokers in the audience. Uh, so it's hard to get, I mean, typically they don't get your phone calls. It's hard to get to get on the phone with them, but but they, they will, they, yeah, they will try to squeeze the deal as much as possible because their commission is based on the purchase price, right? So I understand, right? Th th that's their job. But at the same time, my job and my duty to my investors is to buy the property at the lowest price possible, right? So the way we see it through a broker is not, is, is we're not going to get the best price that we can get. We know we can get it, right? So, so that's, that's why we try to go the other way and talk directly to owners and establish that relationship and give them the offer. And it, that also at the end of the day means more money uh, to the seller. Uh, at the same time, I acknowledge that a 100 unit property, 100 unit owner will, will very seldom sell to a to a buyer, right? They will use a broker because they will want, it's a more sophisticated owner that will want to, to also get the, the maximum amount of money for, for his property, her property. So again, it's really that smaller multi pool where you can find that specific type of buyer uh, seller to negotiate with uh, but yeah to answer your question we don't we have good relationships with brokers i've sold one property with a broker everything else we've done directly with buyers for sellers so all of the all of the, the properties in the uh the medici group these are all properties that you've found through your your wholesaling methods yep direct direct marketing uh direct mail or or just marketing call calling yep and and how do you are you like just assuming the cost for that marketing uh are you not taking that into account like when you are uh, raising capital for the syndication like you know this is how much it costs to you know acquire the property or are you not factoring that we do factor that we, we do factor that typically when we close in a deal whether it's a wholesale or a syndication we pay ourselves a marketing fee before we pay ourselves everything else, anything else. We kind of basically reimburse us uh, a marketing fee, right? That's what we, all the money that we've been spending for marketing, right? we kind of replenish that little bucket and then we split, right, the, the, the proceeds. But yeah, we, we do take that into account. And with, with the system that you you've built out, are you are you still taking all the calls yourself, or have you are you, are you outsourced that? Uh, it's a combination. Uh, I I I do send marketing where I answer myself. Um, I do have assistants that also help me answer phone calls, and also my business partner has some assistants that call call. I'm, I'm more on the direct mail side, and my business partner is more on the call, call calling side. What's stopping you from, you know, just continuing and kind of scaling up the the marketing to, you know, find more properties and then just find more investors for those properties? It's a great question, and is I guess that's that's a growing pain that we're going through right now. Uh, so now that we have a few properties that we own, uh, we have 130, close to 140 units that we manage and own. Uh, so now we're getting 
busier and busier there. And we're vertically integrated. So we also own our management company that manages these properties. So, so basically balancing all those balls in the air uh, as far as owning the property, do it, going through remodels and then our employees and maintenance guys, that's been taking a little bit of time. And that's where we're trying to basically regroup. That's one of our goals this year to regroup and be able to keep that up and running well and also have an acquisition acquisitions team that can help us keep that system that you're saying going all the time and we can keep basically doing both um what what happens to us is that we get to be like say we find a deal right we're in acquisition mode we find a deal or a couple of deals and we get under contract and everything so a lot of our attention shifts to closing that deal you know raising the money all the legal side and then and then we're running the deal and then once the deal is kind of like an autopilot i mean eight months later six months later then we're all right now we need to go back to acquisition right and the whole cycle starts again right so that's that's a growing pain that we're going through right now where we can keep all the balls in the air and and it it we have basically both things going on in a healthy way um, and profitable as well. And and I also saw on, on your website that you also offer uh, short-term rentals. So can you t- kind of talk a little bit about that and, and share? Because I'm, I'm in the, sh- the short-term rental space, so I'm, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I'm very familiar with. But typically when I think of wholesale, you know, I'm thinking, you know, maybe c c class properties you could be lower c plus c minus um you know maybe not the the greatest of areas uh but still probably livable play, places where people want to live and how how does that relate to your short term rentals and is this something that you see as being a scalable model that you've included or is this something that you're more testing yeah so it's something that has worked well for us we i when the the first airbnb that i did was uh in a rental house um uh, just just uh, this this guy that i knew that was working on this model uh we went together on a couple of them and we basically rented arbitrage right arbitrage so we were renting and then it was going well then that that partnership kind of went south and i kept one but then we started buying property, at our apartments, and I said, "Well, actually, I got rid of of that that one that my first Airbnb, and it was a big house, so I had enough to put it into two apartments, right? Two of our two of my apartments. So we had two properties at the time. So I put one Airbnb at one unit and one Airbnb in the other on the other property, and I and I came up with two units." And, and I mean, from there work well, um, and like you said, these properties are, yes, yes, are class C, but as we remodel them, they look, we work, we remodel our properties in a way that they'll look better than the properties around them. So people will want to live in them and they, they remodel nicely. So I started with those two and then, uh, my business partner starting adding a few. So now we have a total of seven uh, and there's two more coming up online in February. So there should be nine uh, by the end of this month. All of them are in our properties. And is this something that you, I mean, do you, do you find it worth it, including, uh, you know, that extra step? Is that something that you also manage in-house as well? Uh, extra step? Like, is is this is this adding short-term rentals instead of, you know, just having everything passive, you know, long-term, you know, adding... You know, I don't know if you're managing the properties yourself or if you have a property manager. Yeah, we have a manager, uh, and then we have also a little system for the for the short term rental itself. Uh, so, and you know, we have a cleaning lady. Or conveniently, our cleaning lady lives in one of our properties. Uh, so, so we have a little system going on there where where it's almost an autopilot, aside from. You know, if there's, there's, well, the cool thing is like, if there's a maintenance issue, we own the property. So we, we sent maintenance, right? So, um, they're almost at a point where they're really on autopilot aside from when you have to put one together, you have to buy a lot, buy a lot of, you know, furniture and those things, set it up, put it in an Airbnb. And then after that is really, 
an autopilot. So it it is really a little extra uh, for us. We we rented from ourselves. You know, we we as individuals. Uh, we have a different entity that rents from the ownership entity. We pay rent. And then that little extra arbitrage is that it's our profit on the side, uh, which, I mean, helps for taxes and those kind of things. So you're you're paying the, the market rent yourself and you'll, you'll just arbitrage your, your own units? Yes. Huh. So it's a okay. win-win. And both this is a win-win for both. So it doesn't, doesn't affect any of the investors' returns or anything? This is just something... And and what 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 are you seeing for your returns with your your short term rentals? Well, interestingly enough, uh, the the through twenty twenty uh, with the whole pandemic, um, a lot of the rentals have been like multi month rentals. One of one of them was rented for like nine months out of out of the year twenty twenty, um, and so I was making like a good. 350 maybe 350 to 400 a month um and the other one also rented uh, it, it, it's since the pandemic we don't see very much the like the two-day three-day guest most of them it's like at least the very minimum a week and that's rare right it's two weeks eight weeks um mccallan has a has a strong um uh, like hospital traveling. It's not one hospital, but like multiple hospitals, but it's a strong, and there's also school uh, for, for, for like medical school. So we get a lot of medical students that come from out of state and stay there for three weeks, for three months for like some kind of like course or something. And also now we've been getting some of those uh, like traveling nurses for like eight weeks. So, it, it's it's very simple. So when you get that long term stay, uh, your your expense goes down because you don't you don't pay as much on on like cleaning fees and like you know the little toiletries and stuff that you put. You only put enough for like four or five days, right? If they stay longer, well, they, I mean they'll have to bring their own shampoo and, and soap and things like that. So it, it that just bumps your profit a little bit up. So it's it's been going well. So, so you're more like a uh, corporate housing provider at this point. Right. Rather than it's, it's been, I mean, it, it wasn't done like that on purpose, but that's how it's turned out since the pandemic. It's been more of, of a like longer stay term and people like it. Interesting. Wow. Very, very interesting. And and that's a, that's even after. So you're making around 350 or 300 to 400 after the manage management fees. Yeah. After the, after the whole thing. Wow. Interesting. Okay. So if you could go back and start from scratch, what, what would you do differently? I think a lot of people say this, but it, I think it is true. I would, I would go straight into multifamily. I mean, but at the same time, I, I mean, I knew, I learned a lot of things through single family and started like the mobile homes and things like that. But I would probably go faster into, into, into multifamily. And, and, and that's even, you know, foregoing the whole wholesaling experience and, and, what you've kind of learned up to this point or multifamily either uh, both wholesaling multi and and buying multifamily but just go straight into multifamily kind of skip the single family in in the mobile homes <laughs> do you do you think that this is um kind of the the niche that you foresee yourself staying in longer term like uh, i don't like you said they're they're with the wholesaling of the multifamily, you know, you've, you found kind of a sweet spot and you have a good system, but is this something that you'd want to continue at scale? Because you said it like around that hundred unit mark, you get a different type of investor that owns these properties and different people that are trying to purchase them. Yeah. A hundred percent. So at, at the same time, I think we're, we're basically uh, seasoning ourselves to, to become that investor, right. On the a hundred plus unit that, that we will be able, I think we're, we're either there or very close to being able to buy like, you know, 150 unit property uh, with the partners that we have in, in, in the relationships that we have with lenders and, and investors. Uh, but it took us, you know, this five years, six years to get there. Right. So, so yes, I definitely want to keep growing in multifamily. It's definitely an asset class that I will stay in. Uh, but I'm all, I also want to diversify 
uh, storage units. It's definitely uh, on the horizon. We own a property that has um, probably almost an acre um, empty, an empty lot. So I want to build a storage facility there. It's going to be small. It's going to be about 100, 180 to 100 uh, storage units. So storage units is definitely in the horizon. And uh, I mean, diversify on other things. Definitely like the uh, being passive, being passive, being a passive investor on deals to just get that cash flow. Um, I don't want to be an operator for, I mean, forever. I, I want to be an operator to make money to be able to put it on other people's deals. And I can go back to Brazil while they operate their deals and I keep getting my cash flow. <laughs> You want to go back, go back to your roots and start uh, investing into mobile home parks or wholesaling mobile home parks or anything like that. That would be that would be interesting. I mean, I just, I like the mobile home park um, industry too. I haven't really dived too much into it. It's interesting, uh, but I feel like it, it's a lot more competitive than than multi. So I haven't really messed with it that that much. I wouldn't I wouldn't be opposed to investing in one of those things. Uh, but it, it is interesting. I mean, between multi, between uh, mobile home parks and storage units, that that would that's probably where I would diversify next. Awesome. And and what's the best way if anybody wants to be able to reach out to you? Um, uh, how can how can they get in touch? For sure. Um, so we have our webpage, uh, demedicigroup.com, and there's a way you can go to contact us, and there's a way to set up a quick a 15 minute conference call with me, and you can also subscribe to our the newsletter. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at uh, Mau RMS, M A U R M S. You can follow me there. And on Facebook, we have a webpage, the Medici Group. Awesome. And of course, we'll include all the links in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mauricio, for, for taking the time. Uh, really interesting conversation. Uh, didn't expect it to go this way. But until next time, deal makers, I'll talk to you all later. So thanks, Julian. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Hope you all enjoyed this episode. If you did, please go on over to iTunes and leave us a review as that greatly supports the show. And if you'd like to be able to connect with John, the community and I, then come and join us on our Facebook group, the Multifamily Success Network, where you can connect and make deals with other multifamily investors. Go to multifsuccess.com backslash community.